What's going on everybody? This video is intended to be a primer or an introduction into the GameStop saga. I'm super interested in this topic. I hope that you find it as fascinating as I do. What you'll find in this channel is a variety of videos that explain a lot of the topics I'm going to talk about here, but in more depth. So I wanted to provide like a broad overview. And then in the description, you can find links to the videos to dig in more to particular topics. So let's hop right into the story. Basically where the story really kicks off is back in 2020 and in uh, uh, 2019, GameStop engaged in a, in a series of share buybacks. And this was at the request of activist investors that said, hey, you guys should buy back shares because the cost of the shares at this point was about $5 a share. So the available shares at GameStop actually went down dramatically because the company, um, I think there were about 150 or so million shares available at the time and they bought them back all the way down to like 60 something million shares. So just bought back a tremendous amount of the available shares. Well, that was really important because at the time there, there was a huge short interest on the stock. And to explain what short interest means is um, when you buy a stock, you go, you go long on the stock, meaning you buy a share of the stock intending to sell it if it goes up and make the difference. Well, you can actually invert that whole process. So firms like Melvin Capital, a short hedge fund, had sold shares that they didn't own of GameStop, hoping the price would go down so that then they could buy the stock later on to give it back to the person they borrowed the share from and make the difference on the stock going down. Well, they, uh, they and others had done this to such a degree that the short interest on GameStop was reported at over 100%. In fact, even all the way up to 220%, meaning that once GameStop had engaged in these share buybacks, dropping the available shares down to about 60 something or so million shares. That meant that there were maybe a hundred million or more shares sold short by Melvin Capital and others that they were on the hook to buy later on. So basically what I have indicated here is this toxic position, right? And that's the beginning of the story because everything to come has, has to do with that toxic position and that these firms have to somehow buy shares and nobody's really selling any shares. In fact, other people are just buying even more, okay? So in an environment where the stock price is now extremely high and you sold these shares at say six or $5 a share years and years ago, where are you gonna get shares to close your position out, right? And reconcile this toxic position. And this is just the known short interest on the stock. It's possible that they were naked shorting the stock for years and years and years prior to this, okay? So theoretically, there could be hundreds of millions or even more of these toxic shorts that they desperately wanna close, but the price is way too high to close now. Okay, so what happened since then? Well, in late 2020, Ryan Cohen bought about 9 million shares, and you can see the stock price immediately began, began running up significantly, all right? He would become chairman of the board he had first joined the board here in early 2021 and immediately the price went up dramatically. Since then, the board has been completely refreshed. All six members of the board are activist investors or uh, loyal to Ryan Cohen, which is hugely important for the future of the company. Okay, An interesting event was in mid-2021 um, during two of these huge run-ups that you can see here in March and June. The price just randomly ran up to over $350 twice last year, the company issued shares out into each of those run-ups, raising $2 billion in cash. So think about what a good play this was for GameStop, just for a second. They bought back like 100 million or so shares at like $5 a share back in 2019 and 2020. And now they sold about 8 million shares to raise $2 billion. They sold them at over about $200 a pop. So just, you know, huge play by GameStop. They now have no debt. They've got a billion dollars in cash that they're using to transform the company. And they've got $900 million in inventory. And they've done like a refresh of like their inventory management systems and a variety of things. And they've invested in this tech turnaround, which I'll talk about as well. So basically at this point, the stock price is just going through these cyclical runs up and runs down, which look extremely crazy. The company is now extremely healthy and under new leadership. And then in recent months, what you've seen is the stock price was basically dropped off a cliff in late November. It had hit a high of 255, and then it was run down all the way to about $76. Well, during this time though, what you saw 
was utilization, which is basically a measure of how many shares that are available to lend out are lent out. And it was at 100%, and it's still at 100%, and it's been at 100% for like 91 days, all right? Which is similar to what happened back here in 2020, leading up into this gigantic price action here. So basically, they borrowed out all the shares that they can borrow again, um, much like they did back in 2020. And then the cost to borrow, another measure that we can see is extremely elevated. So it's now at over 30% for most uh most places, Fidelity, I believe, is at about 29%. So they're paying a yearly rate of almost 30% on these shares that they've borrowed, okay? So typically when you borrow a share, the rate is less than 1%. So these are numbers that we haven't seen since back here when the price basically exploded for the first time. And we're seeing it all happen all over again. So theoretically, we could see a complete repeat of what happened last year in 2021 in January, which is extremely exciting. Um, and then there's been a series of, I've got these all indicated with like little nuclear bombs because these are basically blowing out the toxic short positions, um, ability to control the situation. Each of these is like a catalyst, a catalyst event. So their cost to borrow is rising. Their utilization is completely maxed out. The, uh, retail has decided to start direct registering their shares. We've now direct registered, meaning We've done a DTC withdrawal. We've re removed our shares from the stock market completely. So they can't be borrowed out. They can't be traded. They can't be used as locates. And over 14 million shares now have been DRSed out of an available float or sorry, available outstanding shares of only 76 million shares to begin with. If you consider the float, like the available traded shares, this represents a huge portion of the tradable shares getting removed and putting increasing pressure on these shorts to reconcile this, you know, position that they've been in for years now. Okay. And then the other issue is not only are we pulling our shares out of the market and continuing to buy a large number of shares as we've been doing for over a year and a half, but insiders like Ryan Cohen and others are buying shares as well um, and increasing their positions. These last ones are issues upcoming. Okay. So the, the board has indicated their desire to, or intent, to do a stock dividend split. Tesla did one of these in 2020 and the price since then has basically gone up like 50X or so. So if this does occur, and I've done several videos on this so you can check those out, it puts tremendous pressure on shorts because when you enter a short position, you are now obligated to pay the dividend um, anytime that that stock issues a dividend. And typically that's done with cash and they can deal with that, but if it's, if the stock is, if the dividend is in the form of stock, they're in huge trouble because they already don't have shares to begin with. They desperately need to buy, buy shares, but we keep buying them and that's the problem here. So how are they going to provide this dividend to the people they shorted and sold to? They can't. So they're going to have to close out their positions or it just generates a huge pile of fails to deliver, which they've already got. And it just causes this um, cyclical, crazy behavior on the stock to get even more wild, all right? The next thing is, as mentioned earlier, GameStop's transforming. They've already released their uh, crypto NFT wallet and their NFT marketplace will be launching within six weeks. So as GameStop transforms, generates new revenue, you're gonna see interest in the stock continue to grow and the value of the stock has to increase. Institutions are gonna wanna buy and you're gonna see mounting buy pressure. Okay, so what this basic story is all about is a toxic, toxic position that got blown out years ago and we don't believe it's been reconciled because the price action on the graph and recent indicators with cost to borrow, utilization and so forth, tell us they didn't close. And if they didn't close, they're in huge trouble because their ability to kick the can or reconcile is limited. Um, I think that some people feel like the stock market is rigged to some degree and maybe it is, I would just say that they are accountable to their own rule system and they, and they hold themselves accountable to those rules. So they've got tons of flexibility, right? They can basically use a bunch of shenanigans to kick this um, obligation down the road. But at some point, those number of uh, tools that they have break down. So I want to explain that kind of briefly here. But basically, um, as we buy, meaning retail and others, and as we hold our shares and we don't trade them, those shares don't generate liquidity in the market, especially if we DRS them and take them out of the market. 
That pressures them because the available shares to be traded decreases. Their ability to deal with this pressure, this short interest here, uh, that they just can't deal with it. And especially, I would say the biggest one is if people buy calls and those calls go in the money and they exercise those calls, meaning that they actually demand the shares from the system, causes huge pressure, right? And especially if they then take those shares and DRS them then the system basically has to continually give shares. And the problem here is essentially for over a year and a half, we've been buying like crazy and overwhelming their ability to sell and satisfy obligations. So how can they satisfy obligations? Meaning how can they kick the can down the road? Basically, they had this huge pile of rolling fails to deliver. And a lot of those dropped off in early 2021. Well, how did that happen? Well. One way that you can satisfy a fail to deliver or satisfy an obligation to deliver a share to somebody that you've sold to or sold short to is when someone else sells. If another person sells, you can go, all right, sweet, I'm going to go buy that, that share off that person. So let's say someone sells a share tomorrow, way over here in June. Well, if you sold a share to somebody way back here in 2020 and never gave it to them, now you can satisfy that obligation and get it off your books. So the theory is, they're going to take sales now and cover their oldest positions, their oldest toxic positions that they've been rolling for months and years, right? So there's a, a degree to which they can do that. They can also internalize the order, right? So if someone wants to buy a share now and they're like, oh, we, we don't have a share right now and we need these sales that are coming in to deal with these ones. So if I go out on the market tomorrow and buy a share, they can just internalize it and the market maker has about two or three days to then go out and eventually try to get that share. Well, at that point, where are they gonna get the share from? Because they're gonna internalize as much as they possibly can because they don't want to use the, the very small number of cells they're getting here to satisfy the buys they're, they're getting here. They wanna kick the can down the road because they've got cans they've been kicking from over here. They wanna satisfy these older cans before they deal with any of the new ones, right? Well, what they can do is they can borrow a share. So they can go to Fidelity or they can go to Interactive Brokers. They can say, hey, can we get a share? And they'll say, all right, cool, we've got to locate here in someone's account. Here you go, have a share. And they can basically swap the two positions, right? They're going to have to give that one back to Fidelity later, but now they've cleaned up an obligation from way back here, okay? But we can see with their cost to borrow and their utilization capped out that they've done as much of this as they possibly can, right? So this tool is basically maxed out. Their internalization is maxed out. Hardly anyone is legitimately selling. So these first three buckets from which they can get shares to fulfill these very old obligations that are mounting and growing are limited, right? So where's their go-to? Their go-to is options. Basically, they can do clever shenanigans where they buy uh, in the money put and an in the money call at the same strike and same expiry. And by buying the two at the same time, it generates 100 synthetic shares because the market maker that issued out or the, the writer of those options will generate 100 fake shares. Well, that's a new, a brand new obligation, right? Just generates a new can, right? But they can fill a hundred orders from way back here with those new ones. Well, what happens for those new ones? Well, when those uh, options expire, which happens monthly or quarterly, you enter what's called like an OPEX window and all of a sudden they got to cover those shares. Well, guess what happens quarterly or monthly? These huge run-ups, right? So the theory is that these run-ups have to do with this technique they're using to cover their position. And I've done several videos on this that you can go check out. Again, I'll link those in the description. So the final tool that they really have available is they have creation and redemption powers as a market maker on ETFs, which are exchange traded funds, which are a basket of stocks. And they can actually open up an ETF and they can reach in, take the shares out to then go back and fulfill these obligations that are really, really old here. And they can put a cash equivalent in there. The problem is every quarter or every year or whenever that ETF pays dividends, that ETF needs to be reconciled or rebalanced. And so it's going to be opened up and they're going to need to put fresh shares in there. Well, that's going to create new obligations here, right? And all of a sudden you're going to see the price go crazy because they're all of a sudden obligated to put a bunch of shares in there and they simply don't have shares, right? So what we can see is they've got this old toxic position. They're using these creative, these five creative ways to satisfy their oldest obligations as soon as they possibly can and keep rolling them, 
okay? So what happens over time? As we buy, hold, and DRS, and exercise in the money calls, we are overwhelming the cells with bias. And I don't know who it is on the other side of this position. We know that Melvin Capital collapsed under the weight of their GameStop short position, but what happened to their position? Did it get closed out? Did it get passed up the chain? Did some market maker or prime broker assume that position? And who else are short on GameStop? Because clearly the price action going on here, now that it's so predictable and we understand so well the five different mechanisms they use to kick their obligations, clearly this toxic position still exists and they can't seem to get their way out of it, right? So what's gonna happen in the sequence of events here? Basically, what happens as buys overwhelm sells? We already basically saw this in January of 2021. It went through this exact same seven steps, but it seems to be happening again, and that's extremely exciting. So step number one is you see their internalization ability caps out, and the continuous net settlement system of the DTC starts demanding shares. So you see erratic intraday price action as they have to go out on the open market and buy shares, all right? Because basically what CNS does, it will match all the buys and sells in a particular day and basically net out the difference. And if that net is positive, meaning that there were more buys than sells, it's gonna cause buy action to happen because basically the DTC is gonna go to the market maker or the broker, prime broker, and say, hey, there were way more buys in the last 24 hours than sells. We matched them all up. You need to go buy 30 shares or 30,000 shares or 30 million shares, which happened on some days here back last year. Okay, and they have to go out and buy those shares, right? So number two, as I mentioned, they could be using calls and puts options to basically generate synthetics to satisfy old obligations. But as those options expire, you're gonna see in these OPEX cycles, which happen quarterly and now are happening in the monthly cycles as well, um, they're becoming more violent and to the upside because there's just more obligations than there are basically reconciliations, okay? The third thing that you're going to see is your ETFs, their short interest on the ETFs and the put interest on the ETFs are going to be observably climbing, which we've seen on ETFs like XRT and uh, the meme ETF. You'll even see them go on the regulatory uh, threshold securities list, which we've seen as well on those two. And they uh, just re-entered the threshold security list this last week. Right? And as they rebalance, which happened on Friday, you're going to see more and more volatility and GameStop just ran up 9% during that time, okay, just on Friday, okay? Number four, what you'll see is the utilization will be maxed out, which we've seen for 91 days now, and the cost to borrow climb, all right? So the cost to borrow a share of GameStop now is a 30% APR, right? Meaning you're gonna be paying 30% per year on the price of that, that uh, um, share, all right? So this is already happening as well. And then the final thing you'll start to see is the reportable fails to deliver because they're basically, they basically exhausted all of their tools to use. Now they're basically reporting, we failed. We, we, we failed to deliver X number of shares today. And we just are now seeing this again. So back in uh, 2020, you saw huge fails and it all kind of dropped off um, when the price here dropped way, way down. And I, I believe that's because a lot of institutions sold shares. And when there's sell action, they can satisfy those old obligations. And then also when GameStop issued those 8 million shares out and generated $2 billion, again, those brand new fresh shares allowed them to satisfy obligations. So we haven't seen large number of fails for over six months, but we're seeing those show up again. And that's encouraging because this is the only way you see price action like what we saw in GameStop back in early 2021 is high numbers of fails because after five consecutive days, of high number of fails to, to deliver, um, it's half a percent, so 0.5% of the available shares. So if you multiply that by 0 0.005, you would know how many shares it needs to be for five consecutive days. GME would be put on the securities threshold list, which is what, what happened in early January. What that basically does is break down their ability to use all of these tools, and as buys come in, they have to deliver those buys, and you'll see the price action just go completely crazy because volume will go crazy. Okay, so we've already seen that in the past and it looks like we're moving down the steps here sequentially as we move into 2022 and we approach these two potential huge catalysts. Um, 
that we could be leading into some kind of a like crazy event. So people have asked, like, do I believe that MOAS is possible, meaning the mother of all short squeezes? I certainly do. And what I've got indicated over here on the far right is three potential outcomes for this entire saga. The first one is GameStop's just turning around. They Their balance sheet looks amazing. They've hired amazing people. They've done a board refresh. They're putting out new technology products. They're going to be growing their revenue. This could look a lot like Apple. Apple really was having a hard time in the 90s. And with the iPod and iPhone and so forth, they climbed out of it and just are a success story. One of the largest companies, if not the largest company in the world. So GameStop could certainly do a huge turnaround. And this would cause, you know, obviously pressure on this toxic position, but would be beneficial for shareholders as well. So this is the most probable situation. I think it's extremely likely. What could also happen is with a stock dividend split, the shorts are under immense pressure. They continue to use clever can kicking techniques like one through four here. But you see something like Tesla where the price over time, over the last two years, has basically done like a 25X or 50X because of the stock dividend split that they did. All right, so something like that is also extremely likely. But should it get all the way to seven here, and these other events could also contribute to this, there could be a situation like Volkswagen where it briefly became the most valuable company in the world because shorts were forced to quickly exit the situation and the volume went absolutely through the roof and the price blasted off like crazy. So that would be a mother of all short squeezes situation. Do I think that's possible? Certainly. Do I think it's the most likely? It's hard to say. All right. So that's where we're at. That's the story of GameStop. I would encourage you to check out the description. Look at the various videos I provided. It's an extremely interesting situation. I find it extremely compelling. There's just so much to it. There's so many layers. Um, and in this channel, what you'll find are um, different playlists. One playlist that I particularly like is going into the graph, the chart of the stock, and exploring Microsoft Excel and trying to find patterns. You can kind of see some of my analysis going on here to try to figure out what are they doing with their options? What are they doing with their ETFs? Can we figure out the tools that they're using to kick the can? And in doing so, can we figure out when the price is going to run up and run down? And we've actually had quite a bit of success at predicting runs up recently. So I'm extremely excited about that playlist. Another playlist is uh, talking about the tech transformation that GameStop is going through, exploring what are cryptos, NFTs, what's their marketplace going to look like using their wallet. And then their story time where I talk about different topics like the overstock double squeeze or another one I want to talk about is exactly what happened with Volkswagen back in 2008. So just a ton of content, super relevant uh, to what's going on with GameStop. I hope that you guys stick around and explore it. I hope that this primer or introduction was helpful. But basically, I'm super excited because I think that we're seeing all the indicators flashing that we're approaching what happened back in late 2020 and early 2021. We've got a couple huge events coming down the line here, and it's just exciting every single day to see what's going to happen with GameStop.